Yes. Good morning, everyone. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. Here we are at Fort Bragg Seventh-day Adventist Church again, and we're happy that you've joined us from far and near. And we're in lesson number eight in this series on Jesus and how he relates to humanity. So today we will talk about an Old Testament character and a New Testament character, two focal points of our lesson today. So before we begin, then we have a handout today that's quite stunning and remarkable that I found and I instantly knew I had to share it with Sabbath School. As soon as I saw it, yes, that's the one, that's the one. So we'll have that a little later towards the end of the Sabbath School. All right, so let's ask the God to be with us today. Eternal Father, we again come to you thankful that we can even be here in your house of worship with peace and comfort and safety. The world, Lord, is in a mess, as you well know, from your throne of glory in the sanctuary in heaven. You look upon it all and you see the great controversy swirling everywhere. Lord, be with your people in the war-torn lands. Help them to trust you. Save them. Help them to have courage and faith in you. Bless us here at home, Lord, that we will also do the same. We ask now for your Holy Spirit to be here. We ask for the angels to be here as you have promised when we meet together in your name. And we're doing that just now. Guide and bless us today and all we do. May it be for your glory and your glory alone that we're here. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we have the two giant characters in the Bible today. We're going to dive into a little bit here. We're going to first have kind of a survey over them, then we'll go a little deeper as we do it towards the end of the study. The Psalms text that they want us to focus on is, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You mean, Lord, when I was in that airplane over the sea, over the ocean, three hours from Southeast Asia and three hours from San Francisco, and that giant hand took that plane and shook it just like it was a little dish rag, I'm not to be afraid? Yes, that's what he means, Dean. That's what he means. Yeah, I went through that. It was quite a deal. They talk about clear air turbulence. Well, clear air turbulence is not very clear, and it's definitely turbulent, no question about it. And sometimes a plane will fall 50 or 100 or 500 feet, and you think your stomach's in your throat, and uh, the pilot just says, oh, no big deal, I've been through it many times. <laughs> but when you haven't been through it many times, that first time is quite, uh, quite fearful. I remember once flying back to uh, Southeast Asia to Bangkok when we were flying over Vietnam, Pilot notified us, as I recall, that we were flying over Vietnam, and I looked down out the window, and here was a plume of smoke. We were about 35,000 feet, and the plume of smoke went up at least 10,000 feet in that war-torn land at the time. And all of a sudden, it was kind of a sunset time. The sun was in this window, and all of a sudden it was in that window, and then this window, and this window, and we were taking what he called evasive action. Well, that, give you, that gives you very peace, you know, that gives you a lot of peace and comfort in your heart when the pilot announces we're taking evasive action. But I never forget the sunset was moving around to window to window, and I thought, what in the world is going on here? So anyway, David says, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? 
Yes. So let's dive in a little bit this morning. Uh, sometimes we just, he just spoke a word, Jesus did, and people fully recovered. Sometimes he just touched the sick and they miraculously were healed. Matthew tells us that sometimes he would go through villages and every sick person in the village was healed. Later on the lesson tells us about at least 30 miracles that are recorded in the New Testament. Well, we know there were thousands and thousands that are not recorded because when it says he went through a village and every sick person was healed, that's a lot of people. And over three years, three and a half years or so of Jesus' life on earth, it certainly added up to a huge amount. Don't you wish our Bible was this, was this thick? <laughs> but we have enough here for salvation for each one of us. We don't have to wish that we had the Bible that was 10 times thicker because we do have enough for salvation. Yes, we do. Um, this week then we're gonna look at two very different examples of healing and the one, the sufferer was so ill that he could not even come to Jesus on his own. What a story that is. His symptoms were clearly visible to everyone. In the other case, there were no obvious visible symptoms, but in both cases, healing from Jesus came. We explore today the topic of rest from pain and suffering. We also will contemplate the question that all of us at some point or another in our lives have experienced. What happens when our prayers are not answered? How do we find rest then? Ooh, that's a big question. That is a vital question for each one of us. I'm going to bring up this theme repeatedly this morning so none of us ever forget it. I never forgot it the first time I heard it, that little white tent at Redwood Camp Meeting. Sometimes the Lord answers questions right now. Sometimes he answers questions, please wait a while. My favorite is the third one. I have something better in mind that you haven't even thought of. Oh, if we could just grasp that concept and hold on to it when the shaking times come. So sometimes the answer is right now. Sometimes he says, wait a while. I'm there. Trust me. And sometimes he says, I have a much better thing in mind that you've even thought of. Yeah. Okay, so let's go to Mark 2. We're going to go to the, the New Testament first today. You know this story well. But let's, let's see what else we can find in it that would help us along our pathway to the kingdom. And again, he entered into, by the way, this is King James, and there's a few things here that I'm going to expound on about the wording of King James. It, it just is so wonderful as, as you think about it, the language of King James Version. And again, he returned into Capernaum after some days, and he was, it was noised that he was in the house. Isn't that interesting? It was noised about. In other words, people were talking and telling people, hey, he's in that house over there. That's where he's at, right over there, the healer, the Messiah. He was noised that he was in the house. And straightway, many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. Oh, don't you wish you could have been there, so to speak hear words from Jesus. And they come to him, bringing sick of the palsy, which was born of four. In other words, four people were bringing him on a mat, each one holding a corner of the mat of some kind. And where they could not come nigh unto him for the press. It's another interesting little language thing. For the press, the people, they were just totally crowded in there. Probably was not, everybody had one foot one foot of space on the floor, and they were just packed around him. They uncovered the roof. Can you, ima can you imagine, have you have tried to visualize that? In those days they had some kind of, um, I guess it weren't shingles, but they were more of a, I guess clay, baked clay roof, because it didn't rain there very often, so they could have a roof like that. But anyway, they were able to uncover the roof. Have you pictured that? Jesus is down there talking, and all of a sudden somebody's up there taking away the, taking away the roof tilings, the tiles, 
And here it comes right in front of Jesus. So they uncovered the roof, and they that had broken it up, and they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, there's the key. When Jesus saw their faith, whose faith? The four people that were bringing the guy. When they saw the sick of the palsy and the people bringing him, Jesus said, thy sins be forgiven thee. That was his first instantaneous talk to that poor man. But they were certain of the scribes sitting there, reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies? Who can give, forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit, here's another interesting phrase, Jesus read their thoughts. He read their thoughts. He perceived in his spirit. It's a very interesting way of putting it, isn't it? That they reasoned within themselves. He said unto them, why do you reason these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise, take up your bed and walk? Well, now, how do you answer a question like that to the Savior of the world? They had no answer. <laughs> he always was ahead of them, wasn't he? he they didn't realize that this, this Messiah, this God-man, altogether God is not human, and altogether human is not God, that person, he was way ahead of them. No matter what they were thinking, he was way ahead of them every time. And they never stumped him. They never fooled him. They never, they never got the best of him in any discussion, ever. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up your bed and go thy way into thine house. And the next words, And immediately he arose, took up his bed, and he walked. My! Immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, here's another one of these interesting phrasings from King James, we never saw it on this fashion. Never forget Maury Venon in a sermon. He pounded on that in those words. He, we never saw it on this fashion. Isn't that interesting phrasing? We never saw it on this fashion. And he went forth again by the seaside, and all the multitude resorted unto him, and he taught them. Oh my, what a story. It, uh, we'll get into it a little deeper uh, towards the end of the, of the lesson here. The uh, Desire of Ages gives a little background. The paralytic had done some things that he was not very proud of. His sinful life caused his sickness, according to Desire of Ages, and the spiritual experts drew a straight line from the cause to the effect. He had brought this disease upon himself by his sins, and there was no cure. I want to point out right here, Jesus didn't care whether he was a publican or tax collector, a poor Jewish boy, a poor Samaritan boy, a poor Greek boy, a poor Roman boy, didn't matter to Jesus whatsoever. He just saw a need and he immediately f fixed the need because the four people and the man himself had faith that Jesus could do it. That was the key. But just think, Jesus to Jesus, it, none of those things mattered. In that day, they thought that if you were sick or had this, that it was a, a, from God was doing it to you. God was paying you back if you were a sinner. That was their mindset. Jesus turned the tables completely upside down, said, your sins are forgiven you. That's the first table he turned upside down. Your sins are forgiven you, number one. Then, arise, take up your bed, and walk. And the guy said, well, I think I'll try that. And sure enough, he could. Amazing. And it was immediate. It wasn't five minutes later. It was immediate that this happened. So fascinating. This attitude can be very typical. We often seem to be obsessed with who did it, or what happened, why did it happen. God's original design did not include pain, or disease, or suffering. Sickness came to this planet only with the entrance of sin. That's why God gives us health guidelines so that we can enjoy a better quality of life. Later on we'll find that the Adventist Church was given this incredible health message. After all, God did create our bodies so He knows how best to feed them, how best to deal with them. He knows how best to uh, 
for us to uh, live our daily lives because he is the creator of our bodies. The good news is that God can give us rest whether we are sick or healthy, whether our sickness is our own doing or the result of someone else's neglect, or our genes or a byproduct of living in this sinful world. God knows still how to give us rest. When someone does get sick, it's not good to start blaming, assigning blame at the same time. Why can't understanding the cause of a sickness be in some cases a crucial step toward healing and recovery? Well, we just look beyond the current, the present, and we look to Jesus. As the Bible says, the author and the finisher of our faith. The paralytic felt that the weight of his guilt and separation from God more severely than he felt his disease. A person resting in God is able to endure whatever physical suffering may befall him in this sin-sick world. And so Jesus goes straight to the root and offers forgiveness first. Forgiveness first. As a physician, you know, I'm well aware, and I've seen it probably a thousand times, where the mind is so closely related to the disease. Uh, and our immune system to fight off disease. If we're constantly in a negative mood, and by the way, I might say right here, depression comes to all of us at times. It's not a sin. We live in a sinful world and these things happen. Look at Elijah we're gonna come to next. He was horribly depressed. It wasn't a sin, just it was his human nature. Yet at this moment he's looking down on us right now. That tells you about the great God that we have, doesn't it? Amen. He would take an Elijah who, <laughs> who really did some, after that incredible Mount Carmel experience, he was so horribly depressed that he said, God, just, I just want to die. <laughs> That's depression. That is real depression. Yeah. When I was in Southeast Asia, I, uh, I got dengue fever. I was only there a few days and I think the mosquito met me at the airport and he followed me out to the compound because he said, I'm gonna teach this boy a lesson. Well, they were having a welcoming party for us as we were welcomed to Bangkok Adventist Hospital and I was in the bedroom by myself laying on a bed almost wishing I could die. It was just so horrible. Dengue fever is something, the nickname is break bone fever and you think every bone in your body is broken. You're sure of it, there's no question. Every bone in your body is broken and every muscle is ripped in two. That's just for starters. And you have 103 temperature and there you lay, sicker than a dog, as you might say. <laughs> That's an expression. But anyway, um, oh my. Uh, and going with that, for some reason, there's depression that goes with that. You, you just, you just it overwhelms you. So that's how I was initiated to the mission field. And uh, yeah. I survived, <laughs> took a few days, but uh, don't ever get dengue fever, you can help it. It's that mosquito that comes in. But he spotted me at the airport and he went home with me, I'll tell you for sure. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, depression is not a, is not a, uh, is not a sin. The paralytic felt that the weight of his guilt and separation from God more severely than he felt his more severely than he felt his disease. Okay, uh, running away. Lesson wants us to briefly consider this running away concept. Um, sometimes a depression hits slowly and quietly, takes hold of us, and we recognize it only when it. Lightens it, tightens its grip. Sometimes it strikes quickly after a particularly draining emotion or physical event. For example, God's faithful prophet Elijah, who we're gonna to come to, was completely drained emotionally and physically after Mount Carmel. And I was thinking of some other Bible characters. David, when he experienced his great sin, enough said about that, he, uh, when the Nathan the prophet pointed his finger at him and said, you are the man, David instantly became humble as can be. I think kneeling before God, later it says on his couch he was collecting his tears in his bottle 
and he, he was on the floor for a whole week one time, according to scripture, where he was so depressed and discouraged that he didn't know what to do. And, uh, but David turned to God. What did King Saul do? He turned to the witch of Endor. He didn't turn to God. So interesting, striking difference there, isn't there? Then we can think of other, uh, other people. Jonah, uh, prophet of God. It's, it's an interesting story, Jonah. Some people doubt he ever existed, but uh, Jesus talked about Jonah, so I think we are sure that he did exist. And uh, I don't think we have any doubt about that at all, but Jonah was running away for sure down in the bottom of the ship, and then you know the whole story there. He was later so discouraged because he thought God couldn't possibly save the Ninevites. That would be impossible, Lord. Only the Jews can be saved. Well. He uh, said just, he wanted to die as well. Prophet of God wanted to die, discouraged. But later he, he went, told the Ninevites, if you don't change your ways, God's gonna destroy your nation and your city. And the king of the city and all his subjects put on sackcloth and ashes, that's what they did in those days, sackcloth and ashes and repented and God saved the Ninevites. Jonah couldn't figure out how, how God could do that. Isn't it interesting how a prophet of God could have those emotions? So we're going to come to Elijah in a few moments here. God will see, well, let's say it this way. That can be a painful revelation for any one of us that is seeing ourselves for what we really are. Seeing ourselves for what we really are can be painful for some of us. How grateful we should be for the promise that sinful as our lives have been in the past, Christ, God will see us as he sees Jesus. Now listen here, that's so important. It's, it, it's worth the whole lesson. God, as he looks down on sinful me, he sees Jesus and not me. If I've accepted Jesus and his righteousness, which is surrounding me, he sees Jesus and not me. My, what a, what a trade. What more hope can we have than that? By faith we can obtain and claim for ourselves the righteousness of Christ. Philippians 3.9, nevertheless depression has a way of sucking us into a dark whirlpool of self-loathing. And sometimes we begin to think that death is the only way out. <laughs> you add dengue fever to that and you're really there. Yeah. Um, the good news is that the great healer didn't condemn Elijah. God understands better than we do what we are up against as we fight depression. We may have no remarkable evidence at the time that the face of our Redeemer is bending over us in compassion and love, but this is even what he does. This is from Steps to Christ. We may not feel, we may not feel his visible touch, but his hand is upon us in love and pitying tenderness. God knows and understands the journey is too much. The angel came to Elijah and said, Elijah, the journey is too much for you. Here's a cake. Now, I was wondering this week, um, it says the angel brought a cake and some water, a cruise, a cruise of water. Where did, that, where did that cake come from? Angel couldn't, angel doesn't have the power to create a cake that I know of. Perhaps he did. Perhaps it was manna. It was a manna from heaven. I think it was manna. I do, yeah. I think it was manna. But he, then he said, go to sleep. Then he woke him again a little later and says, you need some more. So we had another cake and a cruise of water. <laughs> amazing, amazing story. Amazing story. It was all too much, the angel said. Okay, so let's, um, let's go into a little deeper into this, uh, these two stories and see what else we find. In the healing of the paralytic, Jesus creates a controversy by declaring that the man's sins are forgiven before healing his physical disease. This was an intentional act of Christ purposefully done. 
The man's sickness of soul was greater than the affliction of his body. He was suffering under a load of guilt and shame because of his past sinful lifestyle. That's brought out in Desire of Ages. If Christ had healed only his body, the healing would have been totally incomplete. Elijah, on the other hand, was a committed servant of God. He had faithfully witnessed for his Lord during the time of Israel's deep apostasy. Then after slaying the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, he was exhausted. And under the threats from Jezebel to take his life, he became discouraged. God met him where he was. You know, that really stuck out to me. God met Elijah where he was. He will meet us where we are. He'll pick us up off the floor if need be. He'll, 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 he'll meet us where we are. That's just such a profound concept to remember. He meets us where we are and ministers to our needs. We will study more about this lasting spiritual lesson in these two stories a little later on. The story of the healing of the paralytic in Mark 2 answers some of the deepest questions about miraculous healing and teaches us valuable insights regarding our growth in Christ. One of the first things we notice is that the paralytic does not come to Christ on his own. His friends bring him to Jesus. Four men carried him on a stretcher of some kind. Evidently they had heard of the healing power of Jesus. And imagine that young man was just pleading with them, please take me to Jesus. I've heard he's a healer. I've heard he can do miracles. Just take me to Jesus. These friends were persistent when they could not gear near, near Je when they could not get near Jesus because of the crowd. Marsh Gospel says they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, there's the key. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, "Son." Your sins be forgiven you. There are deep spiritual lessons in these few words. This man's friends were concerned about him. They were so determined that they lifted him up to the roof, broke a hole through it, and lowered him into the presence of Jesus right in front of him. The New Testament contains approximately 30 separate instances of Jesus' healing miracles. 30. And two-thirds of these miracles, someone brings somebody else to Jesus. Isn't that interesting? So 20 of them, someone else is bringing somebody to Jesus. Often physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual healing takes place in the life of another individual because someone cares enough to minister to that person's needs. Did you notice the words when Jesus saw their faith? This is fascinating. Faith is something you see. It is not something that is intangible. It's reality right in front of your eyes. It is always revealed in actions. That's interesting. In this instant, Jesus honored the faith of the man's friends. Of course, the man himself must have had a measure of faith as well, urging them to please take me to Jesus. The other significant thing about the story is that Jesus had time for this man. Now that really, that really gets to me. He had time for that man. He did not consider his presence an interruption. Okay. He did not consider this event coming down through the roof an interruption. He was teaching the people, probably had some important things to say, but he paused that whole line of thinking and dealt with this man that came down right in front of him. Can you just, can you just imagine being there and, and watching that? It, just, it just, just gets to your heart, doesn't it? As he looked at this poor sufferer, Jesus immediately recognized the deeper issues. As a result, he did not begin by healing the man physically. He knew that suffering, man's deepest need, was a spiritual healing. In this instance, the man had brought disease upon himself by his sinful lifestyle. He was filled with guilt and was destroying his immune system, ruining his health. That's what I was trying to refer to earlier. When we're in a constant state of negativity, it does affect the immune system. That's been proven by science over and over and over again. If we have a positive outlook, our immune system is benefited. Fascinating thing how the mind and the body work together. We have a statement from Desire of Ages. The paralytic found in Christ healing for both soul and the body. The spiritual healing was followed by physical restoration. 
This, les this lesson should not be overlooked. There are today thousands suffering from physical disease who, like the paralytic, are longing for the message, Thy sins are forgiven. The burden of sin with its unrest and unsatisfied desires is the foundation of their maladies. They can find no relief until the course, till they come to the healer of the soul. The peace, which, the peace which he alone can give would impart vigor to the mind, vigor to the mind and health to the body. They go hand in hand. Jesus knew that unless he dealt with the underlying cause of disease, instead of dealing only with the paralytic's body, the man soon would be sick again. Grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust, all tend to break down the life forces, the immune system, and to invade decay and death. That's from Ministry of Healing. That's quite a list. Grief, anxiety, discontent, remorse, guilt, distrust, all tend to break down life forces. Biblically, healing always includes the whole person and involves restoration into the image of God. Sin destroys. It impacts the entire person in every dimension of life. Jesus healed this man from the inside out. The inner healing prepared the way for the outward healing. Even though this man had brought sickness upon himself, Jesus healed him without any questions asked. We live in a broken world, therefore sickness and disease are common. The root cause of all sickness is sin. This does not mean that everybody who gets sick has brought it on himself. It simply means that the underlying cause of sickness and death in the light of the great controversy between good and evil is Lucifer's rebellion in heaven and the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. To state it another way, Jesus is a health restorer. Satan is a health destroyer. Jesus a restorer, Satan a destroyer. A good deal of sickness is caused by our personal lifestyle choices. This is precisely why God has given the Seventh-day Adventist Church the health message. These divinely inspired health principles help us reduce the risk of disease. Some of you have heard this story before, but if you'll allow me, those that have heard it, allow me to tell it again. It's, it's just so, it just gets to my very deepest part of my soul. Dr. Kress went to, Af to uh, Australia as a missionary back in the early 1900s. He was there flourishing, everything was going well. He was happy they were there, family was there. Began to feel ill and he uh, didn't know what was going on, but he got sicker and sicker, weaker, sicker, sicker, sicker. And he thought he was going to die. And the record, the report of this true story says that he was actually planning his funeral. You know, what songs to sing, that kind of thing. Ellen White is over here in California. She had never met the man, didn't know the man, didn't really know who he was other than what had been given to her in some kind of vision, okay? And so she said, I need to write him a letter. So from California, she writes a letter months before he got really critically ill. And she said, what you need to do is eat raw eggs and grape juice. Raw eggs and grape juice, my oh my. So she, he gets this letter and he said, well, Ellen White, I believe she's a messenger of the Lord. I don't, never met her, I don't know what's going on here, but she says to do this, so he did. And within a few days, he was feeling better. That was when they had no idea what vitamin B12 was. Science had no clue, they'd never discovered vitamin B12. They didn't know. And yet those, those foods have vitamin B12 in them. And he had a profound B12 deficiency was later discovered. Profound B B12 deficiency. I've had many patients that I've found with that, with that problem. But in any event, um, he was restored to life and finished out his time as a missionary in Australia. But incredible, those kind of stories, which are more than one, Give, give substance to the belief that Ellen White was a true messenger and prophet to our church. Just, that just couldn't happen by chance, it's impossible. So I just thought I'd repeat that story again um, in this relationship. 
Consider the state of Elijah. Here is a man of sterling character with implicit faith in the power of God throughout the three and a half years of famine. He trusted God for sustenance. Never once did God let him down. Elijah was guided by God to the water at the brook Cherith. He was fed by ravens. I, I heard one evangelist say the ravens would go to King, King Ahab's kitchen and go through the window and take pieces of bread, whatever it was, fly off to where Elijah was to feed Elijah right from Ahab's kitchen. It could be. I don't know. Wouldn't that be interesting if that was the case? With Ahab knowing nothing about what was happening. Yeah. His faith was strong. By faith he challenged the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. You know this story. And the fire came down and destroyed not only the wood and the sacrifice, but the stones. Burned up the stones. Then it didn't stop there. It burned up the water that had been poured over it. it licked it up like it was gasoline. Powerful fire from God out of heaven, I would say. The people said, well, we've seen enough. We're going to choose God. Yeah, that's what they did say. Um, well, we won't get into Jezebel. Uh, you know the story with Jezebel. These are some vital lessons here. Even God's people become discouraged at times. Elijah was soon to be translated without seeing death, yet he too had his difficult moments. Notice how God dealt with Elijah's disappointment. This is fascinating to me. Notice how God dealt with Elijah's disappointment. He didn't preach a sermon to him. He didn't urge him to have more faith. He didn't say, you need to pray more, Elijah. You need to pray more. No, he didn't say anything about that. Our loving God provided Elijah with good, healthful meal, refreshing water, and a good night's rest. <laughs> Isn't that fascinating? Sometimes the best thing we can do for our friends who are discouraged is to be there to encourage them and provide for their needs. Wow. Amen. Wow. Okay. Uh, Albert, do we have about 10 minutes or so? Uh, about okay. Well, listen, we have a handout here this morning. Uh, Fred, would you be kind enough to hand those out? And then we're going to spend some time on the handout. I do want to uh, talk about one thing here in exalting the cross. As Fred is doing this, uh, the concentrated messengers who in the early days of Christianity carried to a perishing world the glad tidings of salvation allowed no fault of ex self-exaltation to mar their presentation of Christ and him crucified. They coveted neither authority nor preeminence. Hiding self in the Savior, they exalted the great plan of salvation and the life of Christ, the author and the finisher of this plan. Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever was the burden of their teaching. If those today who are teaching the Word of God would uplift the cross of Christ higher and still higher, their ministry would be far more successful. If sinners can be led to give one earnest look at the cross, if they can obtain a full view of the crucified Savior, they will realize the depth of God's compassion and sinfulness of sin. Here's a famous statement. To remove the cross from the Christian would be like blotting the sun from the sky. To remove the cross from Christ, from, to remove the cross from the Christian would be like blotting the sun from the sky. Without the cross, man could have no union with the Father. On it depends our every hope. From it shines the light of the Savior's love, and when at the foot of the cross the sinner looks up to the one who died to save him, the, that we may rejoice with fullness of joy, for his sins are pardoned. Kneeling in faith at the cross, he has reached the highest place to which man can attain. Okay, uh, let's, let's read these now. Heaven's highest attraction. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Famous text from Hebrews 4.16. After pointing to Christ, a compassionate intercessor who is touched with the feeling of our infirmities, the apostle says, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. The throne of grace represents the kingdom of grace, for the existence of a throne implies the existence of a kingdom. God's appointments and grants in our behalf are without limit. The throne of grace is itself the highest attraction because occupied by one who permits us to call him Father. But God did not deem the principle of salvation complete. 
while invested only with his own love. By his appointment, he has placed at his altar an advocate clothed with our nature. Listen to these words. Our advocate is clothed with our nature as our intercessor. His office work is to introduce us to God as his sons and daughters. Christ intercedes in behalf of those who have received him. To them he gives power to virtue of his own merits, to become members of the royal family, children of the heavenly king. And the Father demonstrates his infinite love for Christ who paid our ransom with his blood by receiving and welcoming Christ's friends as his friends. He is satisfied with the atonement made. He is glorified by the incarnation, the life, death, and mediation of his Son. No sooner does the child of God approach the mercy seat than he becomes the client of the great advocate. Listen to that sentence. No sooner do we approach the mercy seat in our prayers or on our knees than he becomes the client of the great advocate. At his first utterance of penitence and appeal for pardon, Christ gives, takes our case and makes it his own, presenting the supplication before the Father as his own request. Did you hear that? As his own request. Our request is Jesus' request. As Christ intercedes on our behalf, the Father lays open all the treasures of his grace for our appropriation to be enjoyed and to be communicated to others. Ask in my name, Jesus says, and I do not say that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself already loves you because you have loved me. Make use of my name. Make use of my name. This will give your prayers efficiency, and the Father will give you the riches of his grace. Wherefore, ask, and you shall receive, and your joy may be full. John 16, 24. There's some beautiful statements in that reading. Perhaps we don't have time to do the second one. You can take it home and read it yourself. Uh, Christ is priest upon the throne. It's a powerful, similar statements in here. I'll just read the last paragraph. We are now living in the great day of atonement. All who would have their names retained in the book of life should now in the remaining days of their probation afflict their souls before God by sorrow for sin and true repentance. There must be deep, faithful searching of our hearts. So these are what I call keepers. They impressed me greatly as I read them and wanted to share them with the Sabbath school. Father in heaven, this morning again we come to you. We're thankful for the lessons from the New and the Old Testament about real people, discouraged people, sick people. They came to you and you gave them peace and comfort and healing. The man was so depressed, wish he could die, is now in heaven as the first fruits of the resurrection, a representative of those who will be translated living when you come in the clouds of heaven. Oh Lord, help us to hang on to these truths. Hang on to them with every fiber of our being so that we can know for a surety that our salvation is secure. Help us to know you better every day that we live. We ask this in the name of our precious Savior. Amen.